At a salubrious hair salon in Bangalore, stylist to the stars Prasad Bidapa is trying to shape and fashion the next Miss India. chicken because you tend to put on a lot of weight for a minute. Is it possible to go on a fish diet? Like most women here, these beauty queens have one thing in common, long, lustrous hair. It's an asset they treasure, nurture and keep in its original state. Straight, uncoloured, untampered with. I think that for many women, the hair is really the crowning glory, you know. It's an intrinsic part of your look and we talk about having a bad hair day. So you can imagine how great it is when you have a good hair day. So I think it's really important. These women need to maintain their hair to get where they want to go. But millions of other Indians believe sacrificing their hair is the path to happiness. southern India, the Hindu faithful have come to venerate the god Ganesh. They've travelled for days to queue for hours in the hope that their prayers will be answered. In their pursuit of good fortune, many will make a very personal offering. Jayanti, her husband and her sister, are just three among the thousands making the pilgrimage today. Jayanti is honouring a promise to the God she believes healed her. She hasn't anything more valuable to offer than her hair. This is called tonsuring and every year millions of Hindu pilgrims shave their heads out of humility and in gratitude to the gods. The barbers are kept busy 24 hours a day with dozens to a room. They remove hair from the willing and some too young to understand. Auntie knows what she's doing, but she has no idea what will become of her hair. She's not thinking about it. On this day, the process is being replicated at hundreds of temples across southern India. With each hour, the pile of hair drying in the sun outside the temple grows. Thousands of heads will be shaved, tons of hair will be gathered. Twenty years ago, the hair gathered by temples was used to stuff mattresses. 
Now tonsuring centre managers like Selvin pack it and dispatch it to a chain of middlemen. Each temple has a contract to sell hair to a particular company or auctions it to the highest bidder. By law, the temples are supposed to pour the money back into welfare programs for the pilgrims, but exactly how much and precisely where is impossible to gauge. We can tell you though that at the next stop of the hair trail, the value has already exploded. In a factory on the outskirts of Bangalore, hair dealer Mayur Balsara is finalising his latest purchase from the temples. They've uh, booked um, seven or eight bags in the train. So I wanted to know, is Biresh free with the truck to go over and pick them up? It's almost like six, seven kilos of hair. Mayor Balsara sources his stock from up to 20 temples across southern India. Raised in the UK, he's returned yes, to his like family's homeland starts, to the ground um, floor of a rapidly uh, expanding industry. On average, say in a month, we're getting about uh, in excess of um, five tons. Um, this is just one example of, you know, how the hair comes. So it comes in these gunny bags. Um, in the stockroom here then, we log it in, we weigh it, and we do the initial inspection before we put it into the uh, initial stages of production. On average, we would pay approximately, for a kilo, 250 to 300 US dollars. That's an average price. Depending upon the quality and the length, etc., it can be more. <coughs> There is no machinery on this factory floor. The work is all done by hand. The hair is washed, combed, and sorted into various lengths. Um, we've been drawing out the longer lengths, yes. and now, as you can see, they're progressing towards the shorter lengths. The demand for really good quality and super quality, fine quality hair is always there, and it's always growing. The long lengths of hair are the most valuable. In the coming months, these high quality locks will continue their journey west, destined for high fashion and glamour. They've all gone absolutely nuts. The orders are coming in, yeah, three times faster than we can possibly ship them out. From the temples through the middlemen, the next stop for the best of the best locks is Rome. We're not left, um, you know, sort of behind the eight ball, which is... Which is Bangalore hair buyer Mayul Balsara is on a conference call to a man in Italy who can't get enough of his hair. Basically, you are guaranteeing that within the next three months, you're going to send a minimum, a minimum, of eight to ten, possibly even twelve tons, okay? This hair is unprocessed virgin hair. Ready David A. Gold is widely regarded as the founder of the hair extension industry. We treat hair as if it were cashmere wool. He's of British and Italian heritage and his company Great Lengths supplies top-of-the-range hair extensions to thousands of salons in more than 50 countries. This market is gigantic, beyond comprehension. We're talking about billions and billions of dollars of turnover yearly in this extension field. Now here's some hair that has taken maybe 12, maybe even 15 years to grow to this length. Very, very expensive. I mean, a kilo of hair this length would be easily $2,500. And this is probably about half a kilo, we can measure this, we can weigh this. Yep, 536 grams. So that's worth... So that's worth about $1,200, just what's sitting on here, without any of the labor, 
anything involved, yeah. Air freighted from Bangalore, the shiny black hair has the pigment removed and turns blonde. Then it's dyed any one of more than 50 shades in the next step along the path back to the human head. Hair is almost as valuable, if you will look at it as, as, uh, as a commodity, it should be quoted and is up there with gold and silver and platinum without a doubt, because obviously the demand is far greater than the supply. The workers here are paid much more than their counterparts in India. This is a high-tech operation which adds much cost to the end product. We have discovered an amazing pent-up demand, not just for people who want to look good or copy the celebrities who go from short hair to long hair in a day, but um, basically for a huge market out there of your average everyday woman housewife who just needs more hair or just a new expression just to feel good about themselves. In an upmarket salon in central London, the hair has finally completed its journey from Hindu temple to High Street. This demonstration, organised by the Great Lengths Company, would normally cost a client the equivalent of $4,000. Well, I soften the bond using heat, which is my little gun here, and um, then it's easy to mould into place. The new strands are painstakingly attached concealed under the top layers of hair. It's a procedure which will take hours, but the look should last for several months. You might come back after three months. I will use a special removal gel and um, we just comb them out basically. It's very, very straightforward, very simple. It'll take about one hour to remove a full set. And so a religious offering in India becomes an expensive accessory in the world's fashion capitals. It's a classic globalization story. Cheaply sourced in the developing world, this sacrificial Hindu hair is making plenty of people outside of India very rich indeed. It's close to Rome and it's on a lake. Great Lengths founder David Gold is one of them. He's pioneered an industry which didn't exist 20 years ago and each year his company turns over $150 million. But his market share is only about 4% of the global trade. The house that hair built, yes. I guess you can say the house that hair built. Yeah. Are you comfortable that the women themselves aren't being exploited because they do have something of value should they be compensated for the fact that they're giving something that ends up... They wouldn't want money. They wouldn't want money categorically. Wouldn't. Do you know that? The women who give their hair up at the temple as a form of sacrifice would, if it were a money question, actually give that hair to the people going around the villages. demand has made hair a commodity in the most deprived corners of India, where a street trade is developing. Murugan and his brothers are called rag pickers. They do the rounds, handing out decorated hair clips in exchange for whatever strands the village women have collected from their brushes and combs. These so-called untouchables have become door-to-door -door hair traders. Though this hair won't make the salons of Europe, 
more likely the cheaper factories in China. This is a country where 320 million people live on less than a dollar a day. Rugen and his fellow rag pickers can expect the equivalent of about $12 a kilo for this lower grade hair, but it takes them almost a month to collect that amount. In the entertainment and fashion industry, hair extensions are everywhere. Got a feeling I'll see you later. I honestly can say I don't know one person that I've come across as a performer, as a model, who has not had hair extensions in their hair. British pop star, actor and model Jamelia was swept up in the early days of the hair extension craze. Back then she had no idea where her new hair came from. I didn't care. I absolutely didn't care. It gave me the look that I wanted. It, um, it, it gave me the confidence that I wanted and um, yeah, it, it was, I, I absolutely didn't care. I didn't care. <laughs> But when a British documentary crew took Jamelia to India to trace her new hair, her attitude changed. It was a particular little girl. She was the same age as my daughter at the time. Uh, she was two and she came in absolutely gorgeous. She had little pigtails, really long, and she had no idea what was about to happen. <coughs> what I saw that day just changed my life. If anything, I would say the experience has taught me to actually appreciate the hair. Jamelia claims she's now more conscious of the origins of hair extensions and wants to see a more transparent supply chain that ensures women and children are not exploited. She's appealing to women to think carefully about where their fabulous new head of hair came from. As long as the hair reaches to me in an ethical fashion, if I can follow it all the way back and see that no one was harmed, no one was treated in a bad way or or exploited, I feel that, you know, I'd, I'd be okay wearing extensions in the future. Those who profit from this industry say the business is ethical because temples which sell the hair pour money back into their community. They say the women give their hair willingly, but the pilgrims don't know where it goes, nor do they know that the value of their hair increases hundreds of times as it's traded along the hair trail. Jayanti, the woman we met at the temple, is happy that she's well and she's been able to show her gratitude to the gods. I showed her and her family some photographs of women with so-called temple hair from the Great Lengths website. <laughs> An ancient religious practice is fueling a new global phenomenon. A sacrifice for some is allowing others a world away to indulge in their vanities. The hair extension industry calls it a win-win situation. But clearly there are some who benefit more than others.
there's a whole new world out there. And we can really and truly say that thanks to hair extensions, we have kept millions of people at work whom otherwise would have had to have gone off and looked for other jobs because of the way the industry is hurting. When I started this business in 1991, everyone thought I was absolutely crazy. Everyone was trying to dissuade me from getting into this business, thinking there just could not be the potential which we have discovered in the meantime for it, for it to be out there. Well, I've been flying now for 20 years. Flying a chopper has been about eight years, nine years. I've done about 2,600 hours. I'm always up in this thing. I love it.